for beginning our study of the seed plants. And despite what you may think, bird seed does not grow into birds. Well, what kind of seed plants are there? There's two basic types. There's the gymnosperms. And there are the angiosperms. Now, there's a number of other names for the angiosperms, but we're going to use that name because it's so descriptive. What do these words mean? G-Y-M means naked. And sperm means seed. So these, the gymnosperms, are the naked, seed plant, naked seeded plants. Angio means box, and sperm, of course, means seed. <clears throat> so these are the plants which have some kind of a box, an enclosure around their seeds. And when we get to the angiosperms, we'll look at that in more detail. We'll look at it very briefly today. So the naked seeded plants, yeah, those are the seeds which do not have an enclosure around them. There is not a secondary enclosure around them. Now, the secondary enclosure around the angiosperms is the fruit. So the fruit surrounds the seed. In the gymnosperms, there is no fruit. A gymnosperm that you know is a pine tree, and you know that the pine tree doesn't have fruit. It's got cones. But the cone is not something you eat. It's a structure that bears the seeds on the top of what are called cone scales. It doesn't really enclose them in the same way that an apple encloses seeds. So we have the naked seeded plants and the boxed seeded plants as the two major kinds. And this lecture is about the gymnosperms, the, the naked seeded plants. Well, where do they occur on our phylogeny? We've been working through this phylogenetic tree from the book Plant Systematics by Mike Simpson. We've done some of these lower vascular plants here and here. And today we are moving up into the woody, <clears throat> the woody plants and the angiosperms, which is here. And on the next slide, we're going to break this out and look at this branch of the phylogenetic tree in much more detail. So here it is. We've taken that one branch and we've broken it out into this big group of plants. These plants here, these are the gymnosperms, the ones we're talking about today. And here, this group over here are the angiosperms, and there is a ton of them, like 250,000, 350,000 angiosperms. And we would have to break this phylogeny then up to show the details of its evolutionary history. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at these characteristics. So we have down here the characteristics that hold all of these plants together in monophyletic groups. And we're going to go through these characteristics, not exactly one by one, but we're going to go through them and see what they tell us about the structure of these plants. So the first one has to do with these two structures called the cork cambium and the vascular cambium. And basically, this is about the production of wood. So woody plants, and we can think of all of these plants, the gymnosperms and the angiosperms, as being primitively woody. That is, they were their very distant ancestors had this characteristic we're going to talk about of having wood. So these are the woody plants. Not all existing angiosperms are woody in the same way. But woody plants have two types of growth. They can grow upwards. And here is a California redwood from the mountains of California. Not a coastal redwood, but an inland redwood, and has a very strong growth upwards. This is called primary growth. Because it happens first. The second type of growth we can have is growth in girth. 
and this is growth in that direction. So these plants also grow in this direction, they grow outwards, and this is called secondary growth. And it's this secondary growth that produces the wood. Okay, we're going to look at how that takes place, how that primary and secondary growth takes place. And I'm going to show you how this takes place by highlighting the various parts of that growth process. So I'm going to use this yellow character here, and I'm going to color in the vascular cambium. Now, in order to save time, I'm going to do all my yellow coloring first, and then I'm going to switch to other colors. So what's happening then is this vascular cambium is a cylinder of cells that surrounds the plant. And this is a cylinder of cells that is continually dividing. So it's dividing to produce tissues to the inside and produce tissues to the outside. And that because it's producing tissues in both directions, the plant gradually gets wider and wider. So we're going to watch how that happens. Here's the vascular cambium. And it maintains itself as it divides. So it divides and its derivative cells form different types of tissues. But the vascular cambium remains there the whole time, that is. It is called a cambium, a continually generating tissue, a tissue that is continually present and continually cell divides. So its cells continually divide like this to produce tissues to the inside and to the outside. So that's all vascular cambium. If we could look up here, and it's much harder to look up here, see the same thing we would see. Here is the vascular cambium. running between the vascular bundles and the stem. Here it is again. It's very difficult with the tools I have to really trace that well. And here it is again in the center. So that's the vascular cambium. The vascular cambium divides. And on the inside, when it divides, it's going to produce tissue, which is going to produce the wood. And the wood is called the xylem. There it is, the xylem. It's called secondary xylem because it's produced by this vascular cambium, not by the tissues that give rise to the primary growth. So you can see the cambium has divided one time and produced a ring of tissue to the inside. If we were to look at that up in the top, we would see that here's the first division that's producing that vascular cambium, it's produced from the vascular cambium, and it's produced on the inside of the vascular cambium. And it maintains itself, stays there, as the vascular cambium continues to divide. The vascular cambium continues to divide 
and the next division is not on the inside, but it's on the outside. So our second division of the vascular cambium is here on the outside, and that is going to produce the secondary phloem. Looking at the top, that division occurs here outside. And we end up with concentric rings of xylem and phloem. Now, the divisions of the vascular cambium are a little more frequent to the inside than to the outside. And so we get lots of wood. As you know, trees produce lots of wood and not very much phloem. The phloem is also a very fragile tissue. And as the tree grows in girth, the phloem is gradually crushed. So here's what that looks like in a real tree. We have two rings of xylem here. Each ring is produced in one year. This is the center part of the, tissue of the stem, which is called the pith. Outside the xylem here, we have the phloem. It's not possible to see the rings in the phloem. Got the same thing over here. We see the phloem. And on the inside, xylem. And there are four rings of xylem, each one produced in one year. Now, as the stem increases in girth, the outer tissues are thrown off. They're called slough, sloughed off or killed. And that means that these tissues on the outside here, all these tissues, are going to die as this tree gets a lot bigger. And so to compensate for that, there is another kind of cambion. And here it is on the outside that would form in this region. So what we've got here is a little enlargement of a small region like that. That's what that shows. And we find down there called the cork cambium. The cork cambium works just the same way as the vascular cambium, but it produces the bark of the tree. I'm not going to walk through exactly how that works, but you can imagine the same kind of thing happening, except producing a different tissue, the same kind of thing as with the vascular cambium. Well, that brings us to the seed. All of these characteristics have to do with the seed, and that's what we're going to spend the next portion of the lecture on. So here is a seed. Let's look at the structure of it. On the outside of the seed, there is the seed coat. It's represented by the black line here and by this very imprecise blue line that I'm drawing. The seed coat is diploid. We'll look at where it comes from, what tissues produce it in a few minutes. But for right now, know that this is on the outside and surrounds the seed. Think of a peanut. Now, for a minute, forget the shell of the peanut. A peanut is an angiosperm fruit, and the shell is that coating around it, that box that I talked about, the enclosure. So forget about that for a minute. And think about a roasted peanut that you might get when you go to a baseball game or something. On the outside of that peanut, there is a little red flaky tissue. That's the seed coat. And that surrounds the tissues that are on the inside of it. So you've known seed coats every time you've eaten these roasted peanuts. On the inside of the seed coat, we have a nutrient of tissue. We're going to talk about the nutritive tissue in the gymnosperms today, not about the angiosperms. The angiosperms are different. And remember, a peanut is an angiosperm. So we're going to forget about our peanut analogy right now. So in the gymnosperms, 
This tissue on the inside of the seed coat is the female gametophyte. or that is also called the megagametophyte. And because it's a gametophyte, it is haploid. So we have a diploid tissue surrounding a haploid tissue. And now on the inside of that, we have the embryo. So everything in here is the embryo. And the embryo, of course, is diploid. We're not going to worry about all the parts of the embryo today. We'll come back to that maybe at another time. But for now, just know that the embryo is there. So diploid tissue surrounding a haploid tissue surrounding a diploid tissue. Seed coat surrounding megagametophyte surrounding the embryo. That is the structure of a seed in the gymnosperms. What's going on in the angiosperms? Well, the angiosperms are similar, except that now the seeds are surrounded in another structure. Well, notice also here we don't have the structures here in the side labeled as seeds. They're labeled as ovules, and the ovules are what grow into the seed. We'll look at that process in a little more detail in just a minute. So our ovules, which will be the seeds, are surrounded by another structure here, and that structure is a megasporophyll. So the megasporophyll is going to surround the seeds, and that megasporophyll then is going to form the fruit. On the gymnosperm side, we have, this is pine, and this is a pine cone. And so in this case, we have ovules. Here is an ovule, which is going to form the seed. I'm just going to label it a seed here. And that is born on the top of another structure called a cone scale. So here is the cone scale. And the seed would be on top of that. So you see the seed is not surrounded. There's a structure that bears it. It is not a megasporophyll that bears it. But there is a structure that bears it and then the seed is kind of out there in the air, not completely surrounded. Underneath the cone scale, here we have a leaf-like structure. There's one, here's one over here, even a little better. And that is called a bract. So a bract is a modified leaf. And you know from your study of twigs that we always have a bud in the axle of a leaf. And so if we have a modified leaf here, we should find a modified bud that is a modified branch. And there it is, the cone scale. So the modified branch here is a cone scale. It occurs in the axle of a bract. And on top of the cone scale, we have a seed born. Before the seed, it's an ovule. And we're going to look at how an ovule then will turn into a seed in just a minute.
Remember, we talked about two types of life cycles. And those two types of life cycles are represented in this type of diagram. Here on the left, we have the case of, a, of what is called homospory, or a homosporous life cycle. So here's a sporangium. There are spores in that sporangium, and there's only one type of spores. And those spores are released, and they grow into the gametophyte. There's a gametophyte. It has antheridia and archegonia. So this is a homosporous life cycle with a single gametophyte, or parts of a homosporous life cycle. Let's look on the other side of this line here. This is an example where we have two types of sporangia and two types of gametophytes. Let's going to start with our gametophytes here. So we have a male gametophyte, which bears only the antheridia, only the male reproductive organs. And we have a female gametophyte, and that bears the archegonia, the female reproductive organs. Now those come from, then, these spores. So here are the spores. They are called megaspores, and they are the female spores. They are haploid. They are going to give rise to the haploid gametophyte. Here is a megasporangium that encloses those megaspores. On the male side, we have spores again. These are microspores, called small spores. Again, they're haploid, and they are enclosed in a microsporangium. So there are two types of sporangia here. and two types of spores, and two types of gametophytes. And this is a case, then, of heterospory. Or a hetero, part of a heterospor heterosporadic life cycle. Now, this example is also an example of ex an exosporic life cycle because the gametophyte is shown outside the spore wall. Now, it turns out that no extant plant is both heterosporous and exosporic. All heterosporous plants, all plants that have these type, two types of life cycles, are endosporic. So it's not a very good diagram from that sense. But it does explain, which is what we wanted to explain, that there are two types of sporangia. So all the gymnosperms are like this. All the gymnosperms are heterosporous. In fact, all the plants for the whole rest of the semester are going to be heterosporous. None of them are going to be homosporous. None of the following ones. No gymnosperms, no angiosperms. What do these life cycles look like? Well, here we have a life cycle. There's meiosis here. Here's fertilization here. So from fertilization, we must know that this is the diploid portion. And this is the haploid portion down here. This is heterosporous, this life cycle. There are the microspores and the megaspores. Microspores, the male. Megaspores, the female. They're going to grow into the male gametophyte and the female gametophyte, sometimes called the microgametophyte and the megagametophyte, which produces our archegonium and antheridium and egg and sperm. They unite in fertilization to produce the zygote, produces the embryo, produces the diploid sporophyte, and then we have our two sporangia, micro and megasporangia. We're not going to worry here about microspore, <coughs> microsporocytes and megasporocytes, but I will tell you those are just the cells, the individual cells that go through meiosis. There's a special name for them. So a heterosporous life cycle. 
all of the higher plants that all the gymnosperms and angiosperms have this life cycle. And it is all endosporic. You'll start seeing some endosporic gametophytes in just a minute. Here it is, in fact, here we have some endosporic <clears throat> endospore being represented. So here is a megasporangium. These are the megaspores. They're released and they grow to produce a female gametophyte or a mega gametophyte. And that is contained in the megaspore. So there's the megaspore wall. I'll highlight it in red. And there is the megagametophyte. Okay, so an endosporic megagametophyte. Here is a real example of an endosporic gametophyte. This is on the male side. And what we have here is a pollen grain. Over here we have a microspore. So there are some cell divisions which take the microspore to the pollen grain. And inside the pollen grain, we have at least two cells. In this case, we're showing those two cells. And that is the microgametophyte. It's tiny. And it is inside the spore wall. Now the spore wall's got a very funny shape here. This is a pine pollen grain, and pine pollen grains have very unique shapes. <clears throat> but there is the microspore wall. So we're seeing here that we have a endosporic male gametophyte, which is the male gametophyte inside the microspore wall. Very, very tiny gametophytes, two cells at this stage, and they don't get much bigger than that. On the female side, we, it does get a little bit bigger, so we're going to look at a little bit at the structure of an ovule. This is an ovule in gymnosperms. Now, as I said, the ovule is going to develop into the seed. So we'll look at what structures become what as we go along. Let's find the different parts of this now. We're going to start here in the center. And this whole center tissue here, including these little eye-like things at the front, those are actually the eggs. This is all the megagametophyte. Okay, so right in the center, megagametophyte. And these here at the top, these are the eggs. They're in an archegonium, but the archegonium is very small, and so I'm not going to try to label it. Outside of the megagametophyte, there is another structure. Put it in purple here. <clears throat> 
That purple looks pretty dark. And this is the mega sporangium. It's actually labeled down here. So the mega sporangium is surrounding the female gametophyte, the mega gametophyte. And then outside of those two, we have the integument. The integument is diploid and is a sterile covering that surrounds the megasporangium. So we're not going to talk very much, or really at all in this course, about the evolution of the integument, but there has been this second covering that has evolved to cover up the megasporangium and provide an additional protection. What's a real ovule look like? So here we have a real ovule. We can label some of these structures on. Here at the very center, we have the megagametophyte. And we cannot see the eggs here or the archegonium, but they would be up here. We can see them in this section. We just miss them when they cut through this. Here you can see there's kind of some little arms that come up this way, like this. There we go. And this whole thing then is the megasporangium. And then on the very outside, or here, we have the integument. And the integument is quite, quite thick. So this is a young seed. And really, we should say that this outer part is the seed coat. and it develops from the integument. Okay, that's the basic structure of the seed and an ovule. We still have yet to show you how these things develop one from another, but we'll come back to that. Let's move on and we'll look at the pollen tube on the male side. So we've seen the pollen, and here is a pollen grain. And the pollen grain is the end has an or is an endosporic male gametophyte. And out of that pollen grain, a tube grows called the pollen tube. The pollen tube is a sperm delivery de device. So the sperm, and in fact you can see the sperm here if you look closely, the sperm are moving down this pollen tube. Well, what are they going to go and how are they going to be delivered here? 
We will watch a video later on to illustrate some of these things. But for now, let's try to look at how the sperm are delivered. So what we've got here again is our ovule. And here are our eggs. This is the female gametophyte or the megagametophyte. This is the megasporangium. And here's the integument. Now look at that integument and look at the very top of that and you notice that there's a little hole there. That little hole is called a little hole. And you say that in Greek and it comes out micropile. Little hole or little orifice. So there's a little hole at the top. And that's how the pollen grain is going to enter. It's going to enter into the ovule. Okay, how does that happen? Okay, so first thing that's going to happen is that the integument is going to secrete a big droplet of fluid called the pollination droplet. And then the pollen grain, so here's a pollen grain, some pollen grains. are going to come and they're going to land on this pollination droplet. And then the pollination droplet is going to be withdrawn, reabsorbed. So it's going to be drawn into the ovule. And as it's drawn into the ovule, the pollen grains, which I've drawn much too big there, are going to come and rest here. So there's the pollen grain after it has been drawn into the ovule. And what happens then is that the pollen tubes grow out. So there's a pollen tube growing out. of the pollen grain. It grows out of the pollen grain and the sperm are released they're released here into this chamber and they swim to the egg So if I could draw the sperm, I draw little spermies there and they would swim down here and fertilize the egg. And so we get fertilization. So the pollen tube has functioned as a sperm delivery device. It's delivered the sperm very close to the egg and then that allows fertilization. Let's look at these same things now with real sections of ovules. So here we have an ovule at the time of fertilization approximately. Here is the megagametophyte. Here is the megasporangium. Here is an egg. The micropile would be up here. And if you look very closely here in this region, you can kind of see some pollen tubes growing down through there. 
process of growth of these pollen tubes is very slow, but they're gradually making their way down here and will release their sperm out near to the egg. So over here in the next slide, we have the eggs here, and the pollen tubes would be growing down here in this way to release their sperm near to, near to the egg where fertilization would take place. So what happens to these eggs after fertilization? So we could say eggs plus sperm, and they are going to form down here the embryo. And I will outline that embryo here in black, very roughly in black. Outside of the embryo, we have the megagametophyte. Here in both of these pictures, this area here. And what isn't shown but which would be on the outside here this is the seed coat. which developed from the integument. I think we're ready to summarize what we've seen about the development of these parts. We've seen now that we have the micropile, we know how that functions to allow the pollen to be drawn into the ovule. The integument is going to form the outer coating, the seed coat. Our zygote, that's the sperm plus the egg. is going to grow into our embryo. The megasporangium here, we're just going to forget this other term here, the megasporangium remains here, but it, it kind of gets crushed as this seed increases in size. So you really don't see much of the megasporangium. And the female gametophyte then is on the inside here this whole area of female gametophyte. And it provides nutrition then for the seed. So that's how gymnosperm seeds work. Angiosperm seeds are a slight bit different and we'll go over those when we get to the flowering plant. Why do we have seeds? What is our adaptive significance of these seeds? Well, it protects the embryo. Embryo is a very fragile stage, and if it's surrounded by all of those tissues, it is protected. It provides nutrition for the embryo. The megagametophyte provides the nutrition when the embryo is growing. It's also the dispersal unit, so that the seeds are shed from the pine cone, from the pine cones, and they are the thing that then can be carried around by the wind or animals and so on, and can find a new environment. Plants can't move once they're rooted in the ground, but they can move when they're seeds, and that's how they get around. They move as seeds. And finally, seeds are dormant. We didn't talk about this when we looked at the lower vascular plants because it doesn't occur in the lower plants, vascular plants. When the spores are formed, they grow more or less immediately into the gametophytes or they die. They don't have a period of dormancy. The gametophytes don't go through dormancy either. So there is no period of dormancy in those lower vascular plants. But there is here in the seeds. The seeds can persist in the soil for, oh, sometimes many hundreds of years. There are big seed backs, banks in the soil. And if you're a gardener and you um, clear your garden out of all the weeds and things, you know very well that there's a lot of weed seeds still there because within a couple weeks, the weeds have all popped up again. Those were all dormant seeds just waiting for the right time to come back. So that completes our study, our initial study at least, of the gymnosperms.